So I had you guys write your initial thoughts after hearing out all these different groups and their beliefs and their practices and how they came about. I had you write your papers and come to your own conclusions at this point in the game as to what is required for a person or a group to be considered Christian. And this, the reason why I had you do this is because if you determine what the core of Christianity is and what's essential for a person to believe, it will free you up from talk, feeling like you have to discuss and argue and convince people about almost 99% of the stuff that you could be going into. And in fact, about 99% of the stuff that we're discussing in this class. Quite honestly, it's good to know. It's good to know if you find yourself in that moment and discussion. But when it comes down to it, Christianity is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm just going to share with you a little bit about how I've come to the conclusions that I have. And as I've gone down this journey of working with LDS people in particular, I found that God has taught me immensely about his grace. And he's also helped me to really clarify what are the essentials and what are not. And there's a couple of things that have helped along the way. One is that I've had conversations with several different people, but one that has really stretched me was uh, I got into a dialogue and still do every now and then with a professor of New Testament at BYU, Brigham Young University in Utah. And uh, his name is Sean Hopkin. And we um, occasionally we go back and forth. And my conversations with Sean have um, really forced me to ask the question, if somebody believed X, Y, or Z, could they be a Christian? And, and so I, I'd like you to humor me a bit. And um, that's why I called this section, Can You Be Saved? if. Um, because I started asking myself the question, well, if somebody still believed that the Book of Mormon was scripture, could they be saved? If they're still a part of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, could they be saved? If they hold to continuing revelation or baptism for the dead, could they be saved? Um, could they be saved if they believed in a pre-existence? All these different types of questions started running through my head. But then the other part of this, and I'm going to get to this a little bit more when we get get down to this a little bit more. Um, I started questioning why we would exclude the LDS, JWs, in fill in the blank from Christianity and their claim to Christianity when there's mainline Christian groups that are teaching some of the same stuff. In fact, some of the groups that I included in this course that I thought we should go over is because, honestly, it's kind of borderline for me as to whether or not I would even consider them Christian. Because of some of the stuff that's being teaching, at the very least, the individuals who are teaching them, I'm borderline as to whether or not I consider them Christian. And here's the other thing that kind of formed my mentality on this. And that is that I heard the testimony of Gerald and Sandra Tanner. And so if you are new to uh, researching cults, and particularly the LDS, you need to know about uh, Gerald and Sandra Tanner. Now, Gerald's passed on now, and Sandra is continuing her, their work uh, through the Utah Lighthouse Ministry. And they have a bookstore that's right across from the minor league baseball park in Salt Lake City. 
and you can find just about any book that you want to on Mormonism. But their website is phenomenal in terms of being able to find just about any information on the LDS that you want to. I highly recommend for your other assignments that you consult that website in particular if you're interested in LDS. Anyway, when they were uh, a new couple uh, and soon to be married, you know, Gerald was already asking some really hard questions in regards to uh, Mormonism's history and the credibility of it. Um, and Sandra, both of them came from pretty uh, prestigious families within the LDS Church. Uh, Sandra's family actually goes, she's a direct descendant of Brigham Young. And so Sandra went on this journey with Gerald, and they wanted to visit all of the splinter groups that had broken off from the LDS Church because um, they were starting to believe that the mainline LDS Church wasn't what it was cracked up to be, but they thought that maybe one of these splinter groups would be able to help them. And one of these splinter groups, actually, they still held to the Book of Mormon, uh, but they taught the gospel. And they have no problem with Jesus paying for our sins on the cross. And they actually became born again, accepted Jesus as their Savior, as a result of attending meetings with this group, this splinter LDS group. And so for a long time, Gerald and Sandra Tanner were born-again Christians. And they still believed that the Book of Mormon was true. And they still held, to a certain extent, that at least in the beginning, that Joseph Smith was the true prophet of God. And it was only later, as they started uncovering more and more information in, in doing their ministry, that they started rejecting uh, the Book of Mormon as well and Joseph Smith entirely. But they, by that time, they had been Christians, born again, believing in all the right things for the right reasons for a, a, a while. And after hearing this story, it kind of solidified that question I was asking. Can you be saved if? And can you be saved if you don't believe in the Trinity? Can you be saved if um, you don't believe in the virgin birth? Can you be saved if you believe in evolution? Can you be saved if you believe that Jesus has already come back and you're a preterist? Can you be saved if... Um, fill in the blank. And so I'm going to tell you uh, what I've come down to is I read the Gospels and I read the New Testament and I continue to have these conversations, here's what I come down to. That the gospel is that Jesus died for your sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. That's from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, this is the gospel that I received, it's the gospel I pass on to you, and then he clarifies in Galatians, if anybody preaches any other gospel to you than the one that I have, let them be accursed. Let them be cut off from God. Let them be anathema. So here's the reality. Here's the rub. Is that if a person believes that Jesus is both fully God and fully man, and I say that because Jesus said in John chapter 8, that unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You have to believe that Jesus is God. And you have to believe Jesus is God because only God can pay an eternal price for your sins. Your sins can't be forgiven by another guy that just happened to be a good guy dying for you. Jesus had to be God or else he can't die for your sins. But you also have to believe that Jesus is fully man. Because if Jesus wasn't a man, he couldn't die for your sins either. He had to be a kinsman of Adam. He had to be able to stand in our place. 
if you believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and as a result of that, he lived a sinless life. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, if you believe that Jesus rose from the dead physically and bodily, and the physical bodily stuff is important because that all has to do with the resurrection. Jesus was a model of our resurrection by his physical and bodily resurrection. And you trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for your salvation, meaning that you don't add a single solitary thing. And in fact, you believe that it's impossible for you to add anything to what Jesus has already done. If you believe those things and you confess them with your mouth, you shall be saved. And you, more than that, you are saved. You have eternal life. You have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And so what that means is that you can have issues with the Trinity. You can be a modalist. You can have issues with, you know, the Holy Spirit being God. Or you can um, confuse, you know, the role between the Father and the Son. And you can... Um, Believe that Jesus was he killed on a stake. You can believe a, a, a number of things. You you can believe in a lot of different aspects of the, the beliefs that these different groups hold and have that born again experience when you actually are given a new spirit, a new mind, a new heart, and you are given eternal life. And it's a guarantee that God then is going to save you. Here's the rub of that, though. If you genuinely have given your life over to Jesus, you genuinely believe those things, and he's come inside your heart, he's going to guide you into all truth. And over time, you are going to be sanctified. You are going to turn away from certain things that you did in your past. You are going to um, believe differently than what you did in the past. You are going to struggle if you're in an unbiblical church and a church where they're teaching false doctrines, and you start reading books, uh, their scriptures, which teach things contrary to the Bible, your eyes are going to be opened to the truth. And it is going to take time, but eventually they are going to come out of those churches. But the reality is that there are saved people within the LDS church, within the JWs, within the Seventh-day Adventists, in fact, within the Seventh-day Adventists, it's very likely that there's a large, large number of people that are saved. Within the Word of Faith and New Apostolic Reformation, it's the same thing. You know, are there Scientologists who are, are saved? Well, I don't know about that one. But anyway, what I'm saying is this, that on the one side, what I've realized is that it's very important to understand where that individual person is coming from. Because they might be a part of an organization that is completely false. But they themselves do believe those things that I just said. And there's a huge difference between talking to somebody who is born again and somebody who is not. And But here's the other side of this, is that it really has been confusing to me as to why we are so insistent as Christians that these groups should not be allowed to call themselves Christian, that they are not Christian. And I'm in complete agreement with that, by the way. But I don't understand why mainline denominations of Christianity that teach works righteousness, even if it's just baptism that you're trusting in to save you along with Jesus, that is works righteousness. If you're trusting in, um, you know, having to speak in tongues in order to be saved, that's works righteousness. 
Okay, that that's something beyond. If you if you are teaching people that they have to sell everything that they have and live in some kind of commune in order to be saved, then that is adding to what Jesus has done. If you're telling people that they have to believe, you know, in young earth creation and a pre-tribulational rapture in order to be saved, that is adding to what Jesus has done. And there's so many groups and denominations out there that, you know, the fundamentalist groups of all the different major denominations, you know, there's some that are Reformed, there's some that are Baptist, there's, you know, some that are all sorts of different groups. They believe really extreme things and they tell people that they have to do X, Y, and Z and they can't do X, Y, and Z. And if they do those things, then they're not saved or they lose their salvation or they hold all these types of things over them. And I'm really not okay with those groups identifying themselves as Christian either. And I think we need to start being consistent as Christians. And we need to start standing up for the truth, standing up for the gospel, standing up for the core of what makes us Christian. Unite around that and be clear in our message that this is the gospel. And if you preach any other gospel than this, then you are not saved.